Hello and welcome to A-Level Geography Explained. In this video, we will be exploring the first inquiry question of the coast's topic. The three main subsections of the inquiry question covered are the features and landscapes of the coast and wider littoral zone, the influence of geological structure, and the influence of lithology. Let's begin. The littoral zone is the wider coastal zone including adjacent land areas and shallow parts of the sea. It is the boundary between land and sea. To help explain this term in detail let's look at a diagram and explain each section of the zone. The littoral zone is divided into four main sections, backshore, foreshore, nearshore, and offshore. The backshore lies above the high tide mark and is only affected by the sea during storms or very high tides. Features here include storm beaches, formed by strong waves throwing pebbles inland, and berms or shingle ridges built up by gentler wave action. The foreshore or intertidal zone lies between high and low tide marks. It's where most wave and tidal action takes place, leading to constant erosion, deposition, and transport of material. You'll often find sand runnels here, small channels formed as water drains back to sea. Beyond this is the nearshore, which stretches from the low tide mark to where waves begin to break. This high-energy zone is where underwater features like longshore bars form as waves stir up and move sediment. Finally, the offshore zone lies beyond the breaker zone, where wave energy weakens and sediment movement is minimal. It's more stable, but still supplies material to the coast over time. Tides are key in this zone. Low tide exposes the foreshore, high tide covers it, and spring tides, the highest, can reach into the backshore, especially during storms, influencing how and where coastal processes occur. The littoral zone is constantly changing due to long- and short-term factors. In the long term, climate change and the resulting changes in sea level influence the littoral zone. In the short term the variations between high and low tides and the energy differences between individual waves can impact the environment. Types of coast There are two types of coast, rocky coastlines, and coastal plains. Let's take a look at the features of each. Firstly, rocky coastlines. These are also known as clift coastlines and are areas of high relief. They have resistant geology, meaning they erode more slowly, and are found in high-energy environments with destructive, powerful waves. Coastal plains are also known as sandy or estuarine coastlines. They have a low relief with beaches or shallow sand dunes. They have less resistant geology compared to rocky coastlines and are a low-energy environment. This next section of the video will cover concordant and discordant coastlines. Concordant coastlines are where the rock strata runs parallel to the sea. This means that only one type of rock is exposed at a time. Let's take a look at some real-world examples of this. Half coastlines are where long sediment ridges topped by sand dunes run parallel to the coast just offshore, creating lagoons, halves, between the ridges and the shore. Secondly, a Dalmatian coastline forms when valleys, formed by folding, running parallel to the coast are flooded by rising sea levels, resulting in long, narrow islands and narrow channels called sounds. A final example, that is one of the most famous coastal locations in the UK, is Lulworth Cove. The cove formed as a result of differential erosion where softer rocks like clay and sands were eroded more quickly than the harder limestone at the front. Waves broke through a gap in the limestone and eroded the softer rock. Discordant coastlines are where different types of rock run perpendicular to the shore. This means layers of hard and soft rock alternate along the coast. You can see in this diagram how different rates of erosion can occur. On discordant coastlines headlands and bays form. Over time, the softer rock, like clay or sand, erodes more quickly than the harder rock, like limestone or chalk. This uneven erosion creates bays where the soft rock has worn away, and headlands where the hard rock is left protruding. In the diagram, we can see how wave energy behaves around these features. Wave energy converges on the headlands, meaning it's more concentrated and powerful there. This leads to intense erosion, which can form features like cliffs, caves, and arches. 
Meanwhile, wave energy diverges in the bays, making the energy weaker. This creates karma conditions, where sediment is deposited, forming quiet beaches. Over time, sediment is moved from the headlands into the bays, further shaping the coastline. So in short, headlands are eroded, bays are sheltered, and the coastline becomes more irregular due to differential erosion. Geological structure is key to understanding coastal landscapes. The geological structure is the way that rocks are folded or tilted, this is known as its lithology. There are some key definitions to learn. Strata is the layers of rock. Bedding planes are horizontal cracks created by separations in the formation of sedimentary rocks. Joints are vertical cracks caused by tectonic activity. Folds are the result of pressure during tectonic activity causing the rock strata to fold. Faults are the result of stress causing the rock to fracture. And the dip is the angle of the rock strata. These features can be exploited by erosional processes to create microfeatures such as caves and wave cut notches, as shown in these photos. There are three main rock types to know, so you can identify potential causes of differential erosion on coastlines. Igneous rocks are formed from solidified lava, metamorphic rocks are formed by the recrystallization of sedimentary and igneous rocks through heat and pressure. And finally, sedimentary rocks are formed as deposited sediments are compacted. There are four cliff profiles to know. They are horizontal dip, seaward dip, low angle, seaward dip, high angle, and landward dip. Firstly, horizontal dip. This cliff profile is vertical or near vertical in profile. Notches in the cliff reflect the strata that is more easily eroded, and there can be some small-scale mass movements in this cliff profile. Seaward dips may exceed 90 degrees. This results in areas of overhanging rock forming. Consequently, this can make the profile very vulnerable to rock falls. A low-angle seaward dip has a profile that slopes towards the sea. One rock layer faces the sea and it is very vulnerable to rock slides. Landward dips feature steep profiles and very few rockfalls. This creates a very stable cliff. The final part of this video will look at vegetation and succession. Firstly, here are two definitions to include in answers on this topic. Halophytes are plants that can tolerate salt water such as reeds. Xerophytes are plants found in arid or dry climates that can withstand harsh environments. Let's discuss sand dune succession. Sand dune succession, also called a samosir, is the natural process by which plant communities develop over time on coastal sand dunes, moving from bare sand to mature woodland. It's a great example of plant succession in action. It starts at the beach, where wind deposits dry sand just above the high tide line. This creates small embryo dunes, colonized by pioneer plants like sea couch grass and sea rocket. These plants are adapted to survive harsh, salty, and dry conditions. They trap more sand and begin to stabilize it. As more sand accumulates, larger four dunes and yellow dunes form, dominated by marum grass, which has deep roots and can tolerate burial by sand. These dunes are still quite mobile and have a yellow color due to the high sand content. Further inland, the dunes become more stable and less salty, forming gray dunes, named for their darker soil and the presence of plants like gorse. Organic matter from plants begins to build up in the soil, improving fertility. Between dune ridges, low-lying areas called dune slacks form, where water collects and the soil is more moist. Here, you'll find grass, heather, and sedge growing. Eventually, if conditions allow, pine woodland or other types of climax vegetation develop, marking the final stage of succession. These areas are sheltered from wind and salt spray and support more complex ecosystems. Salt marsh succession, a type of halosia, is the process by which vegetation gradually colonizes and develops on low-lying coastal mudflats in sheltered estuaries or behind spits, where wave energy is low and deposition can occur. It starts with mudflats, where fine sediment is deposited by tides and rivers. At first, the area is bare and frequently flooded by salty seawater. As more mud builds up, pioneer species like eelgrass and glasswort begin to grow. 
These are halophytes. As the pioneers trap more sediment, the land level rises and flooding becomes less frequent. This allows other plants like sea lavender and cord grass to grow. These species help stabilize the marsh further and improve the soil by adding organic matter. Over time, more complex vegetation such as meadow grasses, rushes, and even shrubs colonize the higher areas of the marsh, where conditions are less salty and better drained. These areas are only occasionally flooded. Eventually, if the land continues to build and flooding becomes rare, the marsh may develop into coastal woodland or be reclaimed for agriculture. This final stage is known as the climax community. I hope this video helped your revision. Please subscribe and check out more of my revision videos. Goodbye.